seen this many kids awake this early in the morning so we're gonna wake up even more everyone we need to put our hands together you ready Ray and um everybody clap like this come on I know you can clap louder than that folks come on Good. 
você.
seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the North American history is full of stories of men, women, families who came to the edge of hopelessness and had to decide how they would move forward. For instance, we could talk about the Donner Party in the Pacific Northwest as they endured, some of them endured a brutal winter. Maybe a little closer to home, we could talk about the Jornada del Muerto which was part of the El Camino Real, that stretch north of Las Cruces on the way to Santa Fe, that 90-mile stretch where settlers and people trying to find their fortune and conquistadors and others through the history of that arid country faced hopeless situations because of the lack of water. One of the ones, one of those stories of hopelessness that rings especially true for me, occurred in October of 1999, one of those tragic points of history that provided a story for us that we tell and remember, and is even committed to a movie entitled The Perfect Storm. When the crew of the Andrea Gale, which was a sword fishing boat off of the eastern, northeastern coast of the United States, went further and further out to try to find the fishing catch that they needed to be profitable and got caught in what they called a perfect storm. In that movie, there's a scene where it becomes clear to those people on that boat that their situation was indeed hopeless, that they had expended every opportunity to find their way through, and they knew that they would not come back. I would suggest to you that hopeless situations come at us from any number of sources. As a matter of fact, this life that we live here is known for bringing situations to our doorsteps that often leave us, or at least threaten, to leave us with that hopeless point of reference. This is beyond my control. I don't know what I'm going to do. There is no hope. If you're here today and that's you, maybe you wandered in here not really knowing if church had anything that could offer you that might help you to make some sense of that situation in your life, a relationship problem that seems to be hopeless, 
a health situation that doctors tell you is hopeless, any number of things that life brings to us leaves us at the doorstep of hopelessness. And so this year, as we come into the Easter season, and we begin today the first sermon in the series that will take us through Easter, what I would like for us to do is to come at the Easter story with fresh perspective. Because what happens a lot of the time, especially those of us who have been part of church for a long time and Christians for many years, sometimes we lose the wonder of Easter. I would like for us to be reamazed this year as we consider the Easter story. And so today we begin in a very unlikely place, but we're going to end up in the Garden of Gethsemane. So if you want to take your bulletin and put it at Matthew chapter 26, then we'll get there in a, a 45 minutes to an hour and a half, somewhere like that. But first, we're going to start in 2 Kings chapter 5, one of the most unusual places to start as we begin to look at Easter. And in 2 Kings chapter 5, essentially what we're going to find is a drama unfolding. It's one act there in 2 Kings chapter 5, but it has six different scenes that I would like to train our attention to, and that will drive us into Act 2 today, which is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Act 1, we meet Naaman the Syrian, and we find this actually, okay, so, well, let me just read it, because Act 1, Scene 1 gives us that hopeless situation, but it also introduces this man to us. So I read in 2 Kings 5, 1, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given him victory or had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor. Let me just stop there for a moment. I know I didn't finish the verse. I'll get there. But what we find in this introduction of this guy named Naaman is that he's somebody. He's a muckety-muck, if you will. He's the king's right-hand man, soldier, the director of the Syrian armed forces. And Naaman was quite successful in that. If you go back through world history and study a little bit about Syria at this particular point in their history, you will find that they regularly engaged in raids down into Israel to the northern kingdom or what would be the northern kingdom of Israel. Naaman is a guy who, who orchestrates all of that. He's the director of the military forces, if you will. That makes him somebody. And as we see in this... The Scripture lays him out, a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. There's your hopelessness. It's significant, and we pause at this scene to underscore this truth. Naaman, because of his position, because of his valor, because of his success as a military director, had anything and everything that he wanted. He was a man of power in the Syrian nation. but he didn't have it all because he's a victim of leprosy. And then, just like it was true in the New Testament, leprosy was an incurable disease. As a matter of fact, it was one of the cruel diseases of those times because it forced people to disassociate themselves from society. And Naaman, we don't know if that was exactly true for him yet at this point. We do know that he had leprosy, and it was a hopeless disease. He was hopelessly lost in that situation. That's Act 1, Scene 1. So let me just stop for a moment as we transition towards Scene 2, and let me just ask you, is there anything in your life today that you brought in here with you that leaves you on the doorstep of hopelessness? And if so, oh, well, let me, let me just go back quickly. I ask you that question, but I know the answer. And the answer is yes. Each one of us, every one of us, all of us have a hopeless condition. We'll get to that in just a moment. So let me just try to pull you into Naaman's shoes here from the outset. And the reality is that many of you may have come in today with some reality that says, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Maybe you're watching uh, on TV or hearing on a podcast, and, and you come to this, and there's something about your situation. Maybe, maybe it's a health diagnosis, a financial problem, a, a relationship issue. There are those things that life just seems to press in on us 
that leave us beyond our abilities to deal with it. And we may well find ourselves to be hopeless. So the question becomes, what do you do with your hopelessness? When you find yourself beyond your resources, what do you do with that? Where do you turn with that? Well, let's look at what Naaman did. I'm just going to tell you up front what Naaman did. He's, he and his king together decide they're going to buy the fix. Verses 2 through 5, we read these things. And now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. In other words, she was a house slave. And she said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, that is the king, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Here's where he tries to buy his way in. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Let's stop reading there, and let's just stop for a moment. When you find yourself at the edge of hopelessness and your resources are clearly not going to be enough for you to get across the line, what do you do? Where do you take that hopelessness? I've known many people through the years who take a decidedly religious answer to that. Now, I don't want to make you think that there's no truth in these approaches. I'll come to that at the end, but just listen with me for a moment, if you will, at one of the ways that we try to buy God's help. I was pastoring a church in South Texas, and one day I walked in to the building, and I saw movement in our sanctuary, which is was just off of the main hallway that went to the offices. Uh, And there was not supposed to be anybody in there. It was dark in there, and somehow something caught my eye. And so as I walked into the back of that auditorium, that sanctuary, I I noticed that there was a person sitting in the dark. And I didn't really, I, I could tell that I didn't know who it was. I couldn't tell what he was doing. I certainly did not know why he was there, and I didn't know how he got in. And so being the brave person that I am and having no one there to help me, I quietly slipped into the pew behind that individual so that I could see what was going on. And I could tell that he was praying. He was praying in Spanish, and I didn't know enough Spanish to be able to interpret what it was, but I could tell that he was deeply anguished over whatever it was that was driving him. And he didn't know that I had slipped in behind him. And so at one point, he prayed something, and I said, uh, well, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I do remember the look on his face because he didn't know I was there. And he was praying, and I'm sure that he must have thought God had answered him audibly because when he turned around and looked at me, his eyes were about this big. And the look of terror on his face let me know that I had snuck in on him. I began to talk with him. Our church in that place was about a half a mile from the courthouse, not much different than ours here. And that young man was on his way to a court hearing where a judge would decide what would come of him. And he said in our conversation that he wasn't really part of any church anywhere. He'd grown up and his grandmother had taken him to church and that was about the extent of it. And he said, I was on my way to the courthouse for my hearing And I thought I would stop in at this church when I saw it and ask God to help me. There's nothing really wrong with that, but it's not necessarily all right either. I mean, it's not completely right. The reality is many of us, maybe most of us, know that when we come up against those hopeless situations in our life, the best thing we can do is go to God. But the problem that that reveals for us is that so many times it's only when we're out of control. It's only when we're up against something that we cannot control. It's then that we go to God. But the reality is that we need to know that we're always hopeless. 
We always need God to step into the reality of our lives, even in those areas and maybe even especially in those areas where we think that we have it covered. You see, the reality for most of us is that we have this God complex about ourselves that we can just handle things and I can handle my life. And matter of fact, if we listen to most of our prayers, most of our prayers indicate that we want God to get in on what we as God think needs to happen. But God in his wisdom allows us to come into those situations that are beyond us, that drive us to him like it did with that young man that day. Sometimes we bargain with God. It's as if we feel like we've got to get God in the right frame of mind to help us. I had a guy, same town I lived in. I came to know this guy because of his son, actually. The, the guy that I'm talking about was uh, probably a little bit older than I was at the time, but his life was very difficult. He had been down many, many rough roads with his life. He had a wife, or an ex-wife, I guess, who lived in the northern part of the United States, Chicago area, and she decided she was tired of having to deal with her fifth grade son, and so she took him to the bus station, bought him a ticket to McAllen, Texas, and put that fifth grade boy by himself on a bus to go across the country. This father came to me and well, actually, I went to him, but uh, I, I found out about this boy. He was in my daughter's fifth grade class at school. And our church began to reach out to that family to try to help them in a variety of different ways. And I struck up a friendship with this guy. And I'm not really sure. I, I think I know pretty much the way he made his living. I don't know what statute of limitations are, so I won't tell you what it was. Um, but I will tell you this. That guy was fully uneducated in what it took to raise a boy. He had a girlfriend. Her name was Cindy. And Cindy was a drug abuser. And one evening, he called me over to their house, and Cindy was there, and, and he began to tell me what was going on, that she had been diagnosed with cancer several weeks before. She, they didn't have the money to take her to a doctor for treatment and her condition was nose diving. And so he sat me down and he said, I, I want you to help me talk to God and I want you to tell God what I will do if he will just heal her. Many of us take that approach probably in a little more refined way but when we come up against hopeless situations, it is easy for us to begin to bargain with God. God, if you'll just do this, I'll do this. If you'll just make this okay, I'll give or I'll do or I'll be something. Here's what I want you to hear from all of that. The best thing we can do when we face hopeless situations is run to God. But we need to be able to settle into his love. We preached about this not too long ago in a different context. But we go to God understanding that God loves us and he wants to help us. And those hopeless situations, though they may be hopeless for us, are never hopeless for him. And so the best thing to, go, to do is to go to him as his child and ask for his help. Scene three, we take another step here. And this is another way sometimes we respond. Verses 6 and 7, we read this. And he brought to the, the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. By the way, did you hear me when I started off and I said that leprosy was incurable? So put yourself now into the shoes of the king of Israel. And this king of a neighboring, more powerful country... Uh, that is regularly raiding your people anyway, now sends a letter that says, I'm sending you my right-hand man, my favorite son, if you will, and your responsibility is to heal him of this incurable disease. And if that doesn't do it for you enough, read verse 7. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and he said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? 
Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. So now we find that hopelessness is contagious. So now the hopelessness of Naaman gets pushed through his king into the life, into the lap of the king of Israel. And he's fully aware of how hopeless his situation is to find some kind of a way to cure an incurable disease in a man that is his enemy anyway. And yet there is this threat that is hanging out there. So when you find yourself, let's transfer into our hopeless situations because today may be going very well for you, but all it takes is a phone call from somebody else and that person be special enough to you and their hopelessness becomes contagious for you. So when you find yourself in those situations, how do you respond? What do you do with your hopeless situations? What do you do with the thoughts and the emotions that just want to run crazy in a time like that? Here's a good question for you. I learned this years ago, probably from a sermon my dad was preaching, if I was listening, which is unlikely most of the time, but I think I remember hearing dad say this, that when you find yourself in a situation like that and you're hopeless and you don't know what to do, ask yourself this question, where's God in this? Where is God in this situation? And that comes from this basic point of reference that says God is God. And because he's God, there's no way in the world this caught him off guard. I had a friend who said it this way. I think it communicates very well. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? Think about that. Let it seep in. Nothing catches God off guard. So in your situation, no matter what that is, no matter how hopeless it may seem, you can always ask yourself, where's God in this? And if you are honestly seeking an answer to that question, you begin to put yourself in position to receive hope that only he can bring to you. Let's take another step. Scene four. Now is when I say God shows up here. Verse 8 says, But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. I love this little part of it, because one of the things that this shows us and reinforces for us is that even in the hope, uh, excuse me, even in the face of the most hopeless situation, when God is there, there's always hope. It may be hopeless for you, but it's never hopeless for God. And so when you come to this, as we find Elisha stepping in and saying, hey, this is just another deal. This is just another opportunity for God to show who he is. Don't forget this truth, that God may have worked a miracle in your life just to get you into a hopeless condition. Let me say that again, because a lot of times church people have a hard time with that. It may well be that God has worked hard to get you into a position that seems to be hopeless because he knows that that's the best way for you to turn to him. He doesn't play games with us, but he does always want to move us deeper into our trust in him. And in this case, this guy with the incurable disease shows up. The king has no clue. His faith is not big enough to deal with this. But fortunately, there's a man of God there who says, send him over here. Let's show him what God can do. Let me stop for a minute and say this. If you're here today and it's a hopeless situation, I just want to let you hear that again. What can God do in your life? And the answer to that is more than you can even dream. God loves you. You don't have to try to somehow coax him into helping. All you have to do is go to him and say, I'm needy. <laughs> I am so needy here. Maybe another way to say all of that is that what Naaman needs and what sometimes we need is for an Elisha to show up in our lives who can help put us in contact with God. Where's God in this? What do you do with this? And so now we go to verse, uh, to scene 5, verses 9 and 10. 
And this is what we read. And so Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. One of the things that we can learn about our hopeless situations in those times when we're beyond our own abilities and our own resources is that we can always recognize that it presents for us a test. The test is, will you take it to God or not? How quickly will you take it to God? How much will you take it to God? Will you give God 10% of the problem and say, hey, I'm struggling down here, uh, but then you continue to work it out? Or do you take it to God and leave it with him and say, I need help? Naaman shows up at Elisha's doorstep, and Elisha doesn't even have the courtesy to come talk to him himself. Did you see that? Elisha sends his servant out there. In other words, it's not that big a deal. God's got this. Well, Naaman doesn't think so. As a matter of fact, we continue reading. This is the one, this is the one where you go, uh, what? Look at verse 11. But Naaman was angry and went away, and he went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Let me stop for a second there. And let's be Naaman for a little bit, or at least see how much we're like Naaman here. Naaman wanted the healing. Naaman was in a hopeless condition. But Naaman wanted it done his way. Now here's where we start getting to the Easter message, and so hang on for just a moment. Naaman was expecting, let's put it in modern day terminology, Naaman expected the prophet to come by and pop him on the forehead so he could fall backwards and be healed. Or Naaman maybe wanted to send in a $20 donation so that he could get a little piece of a prayer cloth somewhere that somebody prayed over and maybe came from Jesus himself, who knows, and that would cause it to happen. We might say Naaman wanted fireworks and pyrotechnics, but that's not how God works. Now, God may choose to work in any of those ways, but the reality is God steps into your need the way he wants to. And our problem, because of our God complex and our desire to make it right is, and to make it what we want it to be, is we expect God to do it this way. And so when we take it to him, we say, do this, instead of just taking it to him and saying, I need you. And we leave it at that. So many of us live in the shadow of God's supply, but we stay in the shadow because we never really trust him. And so when he acts, we sometimes get offended and we give up. And here's the good news. Scene 6, verses, I don't think I finished reading verse 12, did I? So let me go back and do that. Verse 12, are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in a rage. Scene 6, but his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? In other words, they say to him, this is so easy. This is ridiculous how easy this is. Why would you not do that? Verse 14, so he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Here's the message that I think we pull from Naaman's life and his ex encounter with Elisha. When you're in a hopeless condition and God says that he has a fix for you, be careful that you don't walk away from the fix that God gives. I said at the beginning of this message that every one of us in here, each one of us in here, has a hopeless situation. The hopeless situation that each of us carries is called sin. You know, God created man, it says, in his own image, man and woman. He created us for fellowship, not only with one another, but especially with him. And if we go to the Garden of Eden account of Scripture, we find that what God created was perfect in every way. And God created man, and he placed him into this 
creation that he has, and he gave man the opportunity to enjoy life at the highest possible level. That's what God created us for. But that man and that woman decided that they should be God. And so they made the decision that it didn't matter what God had said and what God had directed, they would do it their own way. By the way, that's the sin nature that you and I carry to this day. Each one of us lives with that point of reference that says, I will do it my way. I was with my grandchildren a couple of weeks ago, a week ago. I'm going to tell you, I didn't have to teach them to be rebellious. I didn't have to teach them to be selfish. They just do that. You know why? Because they're just like their mama. That's why. Who <laughs> was just like her mama. It's true. Who was just like her husband. That's me. I see. It all comes back. And we are just like you. And you are just like Adam and Eve. Every one of us chose to sin. And our hopeless condition is that we, in that sin, broke God's design, and we cannot fix it. It is as hopeless as any hopelessness could ever be. Somehow, to fix a broken relationship with a holy God. We are created for one thing, and our choices and our sin nature has caused us to be broken away from that, and it is hopelessly broken as far as we're concerned. But yet so many people try to live their lives like they're going to say, well, if I can, if I can like the guy that I talked to on his way to the court, if I, if I can just be good enough, I'll turn my life around if I can just do enough good and so that when I die, if I have one more good thing about me than I have bad thing that I've done, then somehow that'll flip the scales enough that God will let me into heaven. It's hopeless. You can't do that. You can't be that good. And even if you could, it doesn't fix the relationship. It's not about what you do as far as how you live your life. It's about a choice that you make that says, I can't do this. I'm hopeless in this. You're Naaman, and I'm Naaman with a sin disease, not a skin disease, but a sin disease, and we need a cure. Praise be to God that Jesus Christ is that cure. And so in Matthew chapter 26, we step now into the Easter story. Hear me say this. Please hear me as we close. Jesus is the cure, but it wasn't easy for him to go through that. And we're going to find as we unpack the Easter story that it's more than just a holy week. It's more than just a bunch of events, including Easter egg hunts that churches do that get us to Easter Sunday so we can all feel better about the thing. This hopeless condition required nothing less than a mighty work of God. So intense was this hopelessness for man that we read about Jesus himself, the Son of God in the flesh, God in the flesh, who finds himself in the middle of the night in a deserted garden, and he's wrestling with what it takes to provide hope for creation. Verse 36, and then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And, talk, and taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Let me just stop for a moment and ask you to revisit. I remember what I said when we started. I want you to be re-amazed with Easter this year. Why does Jesus feel this sorrow and trouble? My soul is very sorrowful even to death, he says. If he's God, and he is, and if he, because he's God, he knows what's going on here, and he does, Scripture is clear that by the time we get to this point, Jesus has set his face to what's about to happen. 
He's not af afraid of that per se. I, maybe, maybe the best way we can say this is at this particular moment we find that human part of Jesus and the divine part of Jesus as it does battle. It is designed to bring you and me hope for our hopeless situation. And so there he is in the garden. He's got a few disciples with him. They don't get it. They don't get it so deeply that they decide it's a great time to take a nap. We shouldn't be too hard on them. A lot of Christians are napping through some of the most intense spiritual warfare that ever happens in a day. And Jesus goes to his father and he says, if possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, it's not about what I want. Let your will be done. So let me just ask you to bow your heads, if you will, for a few moments. Let's bring this message to a close. Own what is yours in this message. It's possible that some of us are here today and we're facing some very real situations that appear to be hopeless. Where is God in that? What might God be trying to teach you in that situation? What will you do with that hopelessness? My best counsel to you is that you run to Jesus with it. He brings hope where there's no hope. It's a good time for me to remind you that hope is not just wishful thinking. Many of us here hope that the Baylor Bears women's basketball team beats the Notre Dame basketball team this afternoon. That's a hope that may or may not happen. It's wishful thinking. But biblical hope is a confident assurance based on the revealed Word of God. And the Word of God is that Jesus is your hope. And so maybe it's a situation in your life. Maybe you're here today and you're dealing with that sin problem that I've been talking about. And you've been trying to be God in your own life, and it's not working out at all. In that hopeless situation, there is a light of hope, and it is Jesus himself. And this Easter season drives us back to the truth that he is our hope. So if you don't have a relationship with him today, I would invite you to that. This invitation time is specifically given over so that we can help you. If you're not sure what to do, you know something needs to happen, you don't know what that means, then this invitation time is for that. Dr. Nickel and I would be down here. Others be happy to counsel with you and pray with you and help you find where God is in your situation. And I'm going to promise you he's there to give hope and to give life. Father, we ask you to change lives now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turn.